Now we're going to be looking at the last chapter of the Bible today, Revelation 22. So it's one of the easier ones to find. Uh, if you do have a Bible with you, then please do turn there uh, so that you can check what, what I am saying is what the Bible is saying. And if you didn't bring one this week, then do bring one next week because it's important that we check always the preaching against the Word of God. Well, let's pray and then we'll turn to this passage together from Revelation 22. Our Heavenly Father, as we come now to your word, help me neither to add to it nor take away from it, but to faithfully preach all that you are saying to us in this passage. And by your Holy Spirit, help us to respond rightly to your word, to believe these words, to keep these words, and to live these words. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you living as if today could be your last? Are you living as though today could be your last? Uh, research shows that near-death experiences can totally transform a person's life in a matter of seconds. I read this article from Dr. Grayson online. It says this, a near-death experience can totally transform someone's attitudes, values, beliefs, and behavior. They typically make, a, make people more spiritual, if I can use that word. They make them more compassionate, more caring, more altruistic, and they become much less interested in physical things, in material goods, in power, prestige, fame, competition, and this does not go away with time. Now, I suspect most of us haven't had uh, near-death experiences. Uh, it's much more likely, I guess, that we go on living our lives as if they're never going to end, you know, as if uh, death is something that happens to other people, but not to me. And uh, Jesus isn't returning anytime soon, since it's already been 2,000 years after all. And, and so, perhaps, instead of having our lives totally transformed uh, in the light of eternity, Instead, we do get enmeshed with the things of this world, chasing careers, comfort, children, a happy retirement, holidays, and all that, so that our lives are not that different to the non-believers around us. Well, as we come to the book of Revelation, in the previous chapter, John has given us this glorious vision of a new heaven and a new earth, God himself living with his people, no more sin, no more crying, no more death, all things are new. And God's throne is at the center of it all. God's glory lights up the sky, there's no sun, the water of life is flowing from God's throne through the city, and God's people worship him forever and ever. It's a glorious vision of the future. And here in Revelation 22, we have John's final vision of the end. It's an epilogue, if you like, that assures us that Jesus really is returning, and it's a final plea for us to live in the light of it as if it could be tomorrow. Uh, three times in this passage, John records the words of the risen Jesus. Verse 7, behold, I am coming soon. Verse 12, behold, I am coming soon. Verse 20, surely I am coming soon. You see, John wants us to be certain, assured, that Jesus is coming back soon. He wants us to be ready for his return. And he says in verse 6, these words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. So as we come to the end of the book of Revelation, John wants us to be assured that this vision of the future is certain. It is something that we can build our lives upon. We can be assured that there is a happy ending at the end of history, that God's servants will be welcomed into a new creation. God's enemies will be finally destroyed in the lake of fire. It's trustworthy and it's true and it's, servant, it's certain. He says, the very same God who spoke through the Old Testament prophets, trustworthy and true words that, that all came to pass, is the same God who speaks to us now through the Apostle John in the New Testament. We are given this book to know what must happen and to assure us 
whatever troubles we face now, everything is in God's control, and this is how the story will end. Uh, in particular, John wants us to be certain Jesus is coming back soon. That's why he says it three times. The first time in verse 7, Behold, I am coming soon. Now, I think the fact that uh, Jesus has delayed for 2,000 years ought not to trouble us. Uh, even in the days of the apostles, people were scoffing as if Jesus wasn't really coming back. The apostle Peter writes this in 2 Peter 3. He says, But do not overlook this fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. You see, on, on God's time scale, it's just been a weekend that Jesus has been away. It's a long time for us, but not long for the God of eternity. So he continues, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as one, some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So we're told why Jesus has not come back yet. He's delaying so that there's more time to spread the gospel uh, to others, so that our family and friends and the other unbelievers around us would have time to turn to Jesus and, and escape from the final judgment. That the delay is a testament to the supreme patience and grace of God. It's not something that should make us doubt that Jesus is coming back. And so verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar. The heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. The world will end in a moment, at a time we don't expect. God's judgment will fall. The new creation will surely arrive. And if that's the case, then we must ensure we're living rightly now. So John has three points for us this morning. The first is this, Jesus is coming soon, so keep living in faithful worship of God alone. Jesus is coming soon, so keep living in faithful worship of God alone. We see that in verse 7. It says, Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. So Revelation is called a prophecy, it's, it's God's word to God's people, and uh, in view of this book's testimony to the sure and certain return of Jesus, the expected response is obedience. We will keep the words of this book. Uh, and that is, we've seen repeatedly, if you read through the book of Revelation, that we will remain faithful to Jesus, uh, enduring in the suffering that we face, and making sure we worship him alone, not being led astray by the false prophets, uh, not giving in to the temptations uh, of the devil in this world, but obeying the exhortations that run throughout the book to endure in faith, to worship God alone. And, and that's why immediately in the next verse we're shown uh, the wrong response and then the right response. John writes in verse 8, it says, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things, and when I saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. So John reminds us, he's not writing something secondhand here, this is exactly what he himself saw, and as he closes the book, he records the wrong response, his own response initially to this vision. He's so awed by what he sees and hears from the angel that his first impulse is to bow down and worship the angel who's bringing the vision to him. And notice the sharp rebuke he receives here. Because God alone is the one who is worthy of our worship. We're told here angels are just servants. Uh, and they're on an equal level with, with everyone else. Prophets and pastors, we're told here, no matter how gifted, they're just servants too. All who keep the words of this book, all Christians, they're all equal with angels, prophets, pastors. Because in the end, all created beings, whoever they are, are just servants who exist 
to serve and worship the Creator God, who alone is worthy of our worship. So we must make sure that we do not give God's rightful worship to others. Certainly we must not bow down and worship other gods. We must not bow down and worship our ancestors, whether at the family altar or at a funeral or at Chengmeng or whatever it is. We must not bow down and, and worship the Holy Communion. It's just bread and wine. It's not the literal body and blood of Jesus. We don't even bow to the front of the church. We bow in worship before God alone, because he alone is the holy, majestic, sovereign, merciful, and just God, as Revelation 4 and 5 puts it, who is worthy of all glory and honor and power and wisdom and blessing and strength and might. In the book of Revelation, the alternative to worshiping God alone is to worship the beast or to worship the false prophet or to worship idols or money or to worship ourselves. And the result of all these is to come under the judgment of God, to be excluded from his kingdom. And so we're told the way that we will keep living in faithful worship of God alone is to keep this book open, to keep reading it and to keep living it out. So verse 10, he says, he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoers still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. The angel tells John, don't seal up the book, don't, don't close it, don't keep it hidden. Back in the book of Daniel, Daniel is told to seal up the book because it's, it's for the time of the end. But John is called, told here, keep it open because the end is near. It will come suddenly. So suddenly there'll be no chance for people to change their course. The evil is, will still be doing evil. The righteous will still be doing righteous. And so God's word, and specifically this book of Revelation, we're told needs to be constantly heard and proclaimed so that we land on the right side of God's judgment at the end. It's worth asking ourselves this morning which side of God's judgment we ourselves will fall. We showed in this verse our lives, our character, whether we do what is evil or what is righteous, will show which side we're on in the end, whether we're with the lamb or the beast with God or Satan, with Jerusalem or Babylon. So the first point, Jesus is coming soon. So keep living in faithful worship of God alone, lives of righteousness and holiness, discarding all evil and impurity. And that brings us to the second point. Jesus is coming soon, so be ready to face him as judge. Jesus is coming soon, so be ready to face him as judge. Verse 12 says, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each person for what he has done. I think many times in this world, true justice is never done. Now, the rich and the powerful use their influence to escape punishment for their crimes. Unchecked power and corruption results in great injustice we're all too familiar. But in the end, on Judgment Day, we're told there will be perfect justice as Jesus himself repays each person for what they have done. Uh, frequently, the book of Revelation speaks of the books, right, in which is recorded everything that we have ever thought, said, or done. For example, Revelation 20, verse 12. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And so in this world, we may be able to hide our evil from one another. The corrupt may be able to use their power to escape judgment, but we cannot hide our evil from God. We're told everything that we ever think, say, or do is seen and recorded. What we're doing late at night on our computer, 
or the bitter thoughts that we are entertaining in our minds, or the cursing anger that we keep hidden behind a smiling face. God sees it all. And on Judgment Day, we're told, every sin will be accounted for. Every person will be judged, great and small, with no partiality. There will be perfect justice. And Jesus himself will be the judge because he is none other than God himself. In verse, in verse 13, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. It's an identical description to that of God himself earlier in the book, say chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus is fully a, a divine and he is eternal. Nothing escapes his eye and he will be the one who executes God's perfect judgment at the end. And this passage tells us that when he does, all people will be divided into two groups. The first group is there in verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter by the gates, uh, the city by the gates. This, of course, is talking about those who put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Revelation 7 says, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. You see, we know in ourselves that all our, even our best deeds are like filthy rags. Our lives are soiled by sin. But when we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, his death washes us clean. It takes away all our sins. We are fully and totally forgiven because on that cross, Jesus Christ himself died in our place. He took that punishment that you and I deserve so that we can be perfectly washed clean and, and, and stand in that judgment and enter the new creation. I hope you see clearly here we're, we're, we're all going to be judged according to our works, yes. But whether or not we are in heaven, whether or not we are saved, in the end depends on whether we've put our faith in the death of Jesus, been washed clean by his blood. Uh, but the idea here is, is not simply that when we first turned to Christ, we were washed of all of our sins once and for all. Of course, that is wonderfully true. But that we continue to actively trust in the death of Jesus, bringing to him all of our daily sins, trusting him daily for forgiveness. And we're told that as we do that, as we keep trusting in the death of Jesus, we can look forward to eternal life in God's heavenly city, this wonderful place where there is no more sin, no more death, no more crying, no more pain. But then in verse 15, we have the contrast with those who do not turn to the Lord Jesus. Verse 15 says, Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. The point here is that there will be no sin in God's heavenly city. Those who persist in unrepentant sin like immorality or idolatry will not be in heaven with God. I wonder if you're surprised here by the emphasis on lying here. It says that everyone who loves and practices falsehood will face God's judgment. But God is a God of truth, and so his people must love truth and tell the truth. I think it's very common in our world to, to love telling lies, actually. Uh, Donald Trump was a prime example of that. Politics is so often about lies. That's why we're so disillusioned by it. We twist the truth for personal benefit. And perhaps we're also tempted to do the same in our workplace so we can close the deal or uh, at home uh, or, or even in the church, perhaps. Not to be transparent and true, but to twist the truth or hide the truth or intentionally deceive so that we can achieve our agenda. 
But here we're told that God hates lies. We're told that everyone who loves and practices falsehood will not find themselves in heaven, but in the lake of fire. So this morning, let me ask again, have you put your trust in the death of the Lord Jesus? And is your faith in him bearing fruit in a changed life, say a life of truth? It really matters because Jesus is coming soon. We must be ready to face him as judge. There are two sides we can be on. And the only way to escape the judgment is to trust in the death of Jesus alone. Jesus is coming soon, so be ready to face him as judge. Finally then, point three, Jesus is coming soon, so come to him and receive life. Jesus is coming soon, so come to him and receive life. In verse 16, the risen Jesus reminds us of his absolute authority. He says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. He reminds us that the book of Revelation is Jesus' own words to us. And it reminds us that Jesus rules from heaven, seated on God's heavenly throne, as he speaks these words to us. He's the root and descendant of David. He's, he's God's chosen king from Isaiah 11, who will rule God's kingdom forever. He's the bright morning star. That's another reference to his kingly rule from Numbers 24, 17. The point is, Jesus is exalted as king. He's ruling over God's kingdom. And so as the king on the throne of heaven, his invitation comes directly to us, to each one of us this morning. Will you come to me and have life? Verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who desires take the water of life without price. The Spirit is the Holy Spirit speaking through the prophets. The bride is the church, God's people, and they speak as one. Come, come to Jesus, submit to his rule. In him you will find all your deepest longings met. In his heavenly city you'll have free access to the river of the water of life. You'll have eternal life in this wonderful new creation where there is nothing that is wrong or spoiled. We're free to be who God made us to be, living in his presence and proclaiming his glory. Will you come to Jesus this morning? Uh, we don't come to Jesus through our religious performance. We don't come to Jesus meriting heaven by our good works. We can't buy our way into heaven with our money or our power. This life is a free gift offered to anyone who will simply come to Jesus in faith. Now these verses echo God's similar invitation back in Isaiah 55, I'll just read it for us. Come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, come buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. I think these verses remind us that so often we expend ourselves uh, in the search for purpose, for satisfaction, for deep, real happiness. We look for it in our work. We move from job to job, hoping that this job's going to be different. This one will be better. I'll be really happy in this job, and often we're not. Or we look for this happiness, this satisfaction in our spouse or in our children. We say, if only I get married, I'll be happy. If only I can have this child, then I'll be truly at peace. 
If only I could spend more time with my children or my grandchildren, then life will be worth living. Or we look for happiness and fulfillment in our achievements or in our hobbies. If I can just run the Penang Bridge Marathon (laughs) or climb the Penang Hill uh, or have my food or my lifestyle, then I'll be really happy. I'll be really satisfied. But here we're reminded there's only one thing in life that will truly satisfy, one thing that will bring real happiness, purpose in life, and that's Jesus himself. He says, come, come to me in faith. I'll give you all these for free. So will you come to Jesus this morning and accept this gift of eternal life? Perhaps you're not yet a Christian, maybe you're listening online or you're joining us for the first time. Will you come to Jesus, trust in his death for your sins, submit to his loving rule? You will find the forgiveness, the fulfillment, the fullness of life for which you search. Come to him. Maybe we are Christian this morning. Will you come to Jesus again? Let him so enthrall your heart that you'll never be tempted to search happiness and fulfillment in all those other things instead. To seek happiness, fulfillment in the things of this world instead of Jesus, your Savior. Come to him again this morning. Well, the book closes with some serious words that remind us how important it is that we hear and live according to what we've heard this morning. Verse 18 says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the prophecy of this book, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. See what he's saying? Adding or taking away from the Word of God has serious consequences. At its root, it is rebellious and arrogant to think that we know what is more important to say than God himself. That's the reason, actually, why I preach the way that I do, verse by verse, through the passage, saying nothing more and nothing less than what the passage is saying. And yet, it happens all the time that you see people adding or taking away from the Word of God. It actually happened in our lectionary reading today. Did you notice how the reading left out the parts of this passage that talk about the judgment of God? Why did we leave out verse 15, 18, and 19 from the reading? Look at those later. They're about, they're all the judgment verses of this passage. Did the Apostle John, did the Holy Spirit get those parts wrong when it was written down? Do we know better than God what the church needs to hear? It happens all the time as people deny the Bible's teaching, maybe on gender or sexuality or the uniqueness of Christ, or as they add to the Word of God by promising health and wealth and prosperity and victory through the Holy Spirit, and so on. But here we're told, such people who change the word of God, who take away from it or add to it, have a fearful future. We can remove the verses about God's judgment, sure. We can cover our eyes as if they're not a reality. But God remains on the throne. God's truth remains. Verse 20 He who testifies to these things says, I am coming soon. He will come as judge and hold us to account. The believing heart replies, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. So as we conclude, research shows that a near-death experience can totally transform someone's attitudes, values, beliefs, and behavior. Make them more loving, really, and less absorbed with the things of this world. And that is the same effect 
that the impending return of Jesus ought to have on us. Jesus is coming soon. This day may be our last. And if Jesus is coming, then I need to shape everything I do now in the light of it. Jesus is coming soon. So keep living in faithful worship of God alone. Jesus is coming soon. So be ready to face him as judge. Jesus is coming soon. So come to him and have real life. We are woke this morning, one day closer to the return of Jesus. So let's live as though it may be our last as we live for him alone. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with us all. Amen. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for reminding us this morning that Jesus will one day return. This world will end. The new creation will dawn. Lord, make us certain of Jesus' return. Enable us to be ready for it. By your grace, may each one of us this morning come to him in faith and receive the life he offers. And we pray that in response to his death, you would help us to faithfully live for his glory alone, according to your word, that when he does return, we may meet him with confidence and joy and enter into glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.